the most ridiculous media setup. I don't know why. We're aware. One has cameras, one can't. It's going to be the same exact interview. We, so. We're Appreciate aware. Choir, we're man. aware. I guess, uh, yeah. Eighth place, but a 332. I mean, walking through the race. Uh, I thought it was six, so that's not that's kidding. Um, yeah, I, I. The only thing I'm really disappointed in, um, not the time, not the place, is that I knew exactly how that race was going to go down. Um, I think everyone on the starting line did. And for me, coming into this race, I was actually probably more confident than most guys that would get a small queue going into a final, uh, just because I felt like it was going to be a fast race, seeing the other races, knowing how the way Chariot races. I had perfect position, I'm hit three, he was hit two, and I was just anticipating him going, me falling in, um, in second, third, whatever position, and uh, Jake, thanks to you too, um, and just kind of going along for the ride. and. Uh, the only thing I'm really disappointed in, like I was saying, was just not being in a better position to cover that move. Um, he was smart in a sense where, you know, he got out to the front and then didn't really make a hard move until at the curve. By that point, if you weren't right behind him, it, it was kind of hard to go outside the box. So I try to make a, I wouldn't say like a valiant effort, but I try to make a, a somewhat of an effort to, to get out of the box and to see if I can close the gap. Um, found myself out there for, I don't know how many meters, but definitely not closing in without having to make a hard surge to get on it. And uh, when we're already going that fast of a pace and knowing that you have the whole world championship field behind you, um, it's tough to make that kind of, uh, it's tough to bridge that gap and make that kind of decision to, to make that hard of a push. Um, and so at that point, I, I don't know at what point in the race it was, but I just kind of felt everyone right behind me. And I just let the field kind of, a couple guys go by and see if I can, take a little bit of a breather and sit in what, what they're doing to me. So um, at that point, it was like, you're, we're all racing for, you know, that bubble spot, second, third, third or fourth, whatever it was. And uh, yeah, so I'm just really disappointed that I knew exactly how the race was gonna go and I didn't execute my plan, so. Was that breather you just mentioned about, um, was that a mistake in hindsight or were you, are you fine with that move? Yeah, of course. I mean, if I didn't make that breather, I probably would have faded even harder. Um, I don't even know if I said I should. I, I don't know if I, I guess I, if I looked at the splits, maybe I did fade. But I, I felt like when they went by me, I kind of stayed in that pack a little bit and, and fought, which um, I was happy with. Happy with myself with at that point in the race. Um, it's just I'm not I'm not pacers for those guys, um, and uh, and as they're not pacers for me, it's not like I'm, I'm expecting those guys around. But at that point, I was just like, all right, my next best strategy now is to kind of. Um, mentally take off uh, a few meters and see if I can rally for somewhat of a kick and, and finish as high up as possible, whatever that was in that place. But I, like I said, I wasn't bridging the gap. I looked up and I tried for X amount of meters. And once I realized I wasn't, you know, at this point, it's like, what am I doing? You know, like trying to run a hard race, you know, I'm not dropping anyone. They're still like right on me. So um, I didn't look at the board. I don't know where everyone was, but I could feel some guys breathing around me and, and I just kind of let them around. So you said you regretted not getting on that first initial move. Do you think you could have hung with them though? That he ran 329 from the front. Um, I'm going to be honest with you. Like, <laughs> you, it's hard to say like now, I feel better walking through this mix zone and going up the stairs than any of the other rounds. I'm not saying I left like a lot out there, but that race was better for me to go out hard. Um, I will tell you this though, whether I died or not, I would have gone with them and tried to go with them. And at that point, that was the decision I was making to run for a medal. Um, not even just for the win, that was my best chance of meddling, you know? There's tons of good guys that were kicker, really good kickers that I was losing to in the rounds and I figured by the third race, that race was gonna be the best for me about going 330. So like I said, maybe I died at 331 and I get second, I don't know. Maybe I die and run 340, but that was my plan going in to, if it was gonna be, it wasn't gonna look at the splits, just sit in on a free ride to hopefully PR town and uh, I just didn't do what um, I had drawn up in my head and, and for him to go do exactly how I planned it is the most frustrating part, you know what I mean? How how impressive is it for a guy, everyone knew he was going to go from the front, to run 329 solo, third race in three days, you know, on his own? Sorry? How impressive is that for a Super impressive, runner? I mean, he's, he like I said, he, he's the class of the field, so I mean, it's, a, it's super impressive, I was gonna start with that. But like, is it unexpected? I don't think so. I mean, he's a 328 guy, but if you look at his races, he's taken him on most, most of his way, you know what I mean? It's not like, he was Manigoy who was sitting behind Chariot. It was always Chariot that was kind of taking on the pace when the guys go. And, and I feel like some guys are better at running from the front and maybe he's just one of those guys, I don't know. But with the PRs he's had and the way he races, um, it wasn't unexpected, but it's obviously very, very impressive in a, in a sense that, 
I can only think of one guy, El Baruj, that would do something like that and, and get away with it. So, um, yeah, I mean, it's probably good that he did do it because everyone else in the field ran freaking quick and, uh, and they're really good kickers. So, um, it was, I, I said this earlier, I, just, I thought, you know, um, this year was going to be great for me the way I was dinged up early in the year and that I'd be like, firing on all cylinders, which which I am, you know, 332 in, in the third race, um, 13 flat, like less than a month ago, um, I'm fit, but I'm super surprised about just how many guys are like lasted through this year. Like it's just so deep right now, all across the board, not just the 15 and other events. And uh, yeah, it just shows you kind of like what kind of um, fitness you need to be in now to, to medal. And um, I'm, I'm, I'm happy with, you know, with the time I ran and how tough I ran, but I'm just really upset about the way I executed the race today. Yeah. Matthew, so, I, you mentioned after the first round that you would comment on your former coach, Alberto Salazar's band, which was handed down earlier in the week. just wanted to know if we yeah. could get your thoughts about sure. that. Sure, yeah, I, I mentioned it just a second ago over there, and um, I'm just going to start with saying this. Um, I joined the group back in 2012, um, fully after the Olympics. Um, I'll still work with Andy Powell. Um, I come out of college, I'm 21 years old, and you ask anyone else coming out of college that year, right? Um, whether they're in 1500 all the way to the 10K, best group in the world to train with, best group uh, you would want to go with. I, I don't care what anyone's saying, 99% of the people are going to say Oregon Project. Why? Because at that time they had the two best guys in the world, Galen Modis, who went to at the Olympics, arguably one of the best other distance runners America's ever seen, Dathan Ritzenhain. And, uh, and a lot of times, people forget to mention this, as I said earlier, we had handfuls of other great runners part of that group that everyone forgets to talk about. We had guys, Dorian Allray was part of that group before I was. Uh, finished second to me in NCAAs that year. Kieran Aliner, 334 guy from Ireland, made the final in Daegu that year before I joined the group as well. So for me, I'm coming out of college, I'm young, this is the best group in the world. There's no accusations, no criticism towards the group besides that they're the best training group in the world by far in my opinion, right? So I'm given the opportunity to, to join the Oregon Project. Who's gonna say no, right? Um, like I said, I don't care what anyone's gonna say now looking back in hindsight, but at that time that was the best group. And um, and I think anyone that was in my position would have taken it as well. So that being said, um, I don't regret joining the group. I learned a lot um, from the teammates I had, the coaches I had. Um, I had some great races with the Oregon Project with Alberto, and as I had some bad ones, um, as anyone else does in any other program, but I'll say this, um, again, there's not one time throughout that, my time with Oregon Project was I ever offered anything or saw anything that seemed shady, illegal, or um, anything that you might be reading about right now, um, or else one, I would have left, or two, um, I'm sure a lot of other people that were part of that group that people are failing to mention um, would have done the same. And um, so it's easy to, you know, to talk about me, talk about the guys that end up meddling in the group. But there was a lot more people part of that group that maybe they didn't pan out and that's why they're not talking about it. If I didn't go on to, to win medals, people probably wouldn't be talking about me. It might have been the next guy, like he's with that stuff. So um, plenty of other guys you can ask that same experience as me, you know, didn't see anything wrong. Um, a lot of this stuff um, happened before I was there. You know, like I said, I joined in 2012 and um, the stuff that you might be reading about, um, I'm sure we're, we're happening or, or was happened before I got there. And uh, another thing I think you should probably mention, or I should mention is that I came into the group with a medal already, um, you know, with Andy Powell. Um, my relationship with Alberto might've been different than those guys because maybe I'd already been established. What I was doing was already working. I don't think Alberto needed to, to fix or change too much with me, but um, that was that was just kind of my, my experience and my take on the whole situation. Um, things that I'm reading about now, obviously, Total surprise to me. Um, did not know that was going on behind the scene. I've been removed from the group now for a year. Talking to some of the guys that are part of the program right now, I had no idea. So if they have no idea, then obviously I'm not gonna have any idea as I'm no longer part of those uh, part of the group or really having conversations or um, seeing those guys on a day-to-day -day basis, the staff, the group, and the coaches. Um, but like I said, um, never once was offered, seen anything, um, or else I would have gotten out of there a long time ago. But um, that was just kind of my take on the whole situation. And uh, uh, last thing I think uh, that I mentioned over there that I'd, I'd say, um, my only involvement in, in hearing about any of this or whatever um, was got a call from a lawyer two years ago, maybe? I don't even remember, a year ago? No, not a year ago, was I, um, maybe say two years ago. Um, a lawyer asking about Dr. Brown. Um, my conversation with that lawyer was less than 45 seconds long. He asked if I had ever met or talked to the guy. I said no to both of them. I said the guy could have walked into the room that I was, um, had the conversation, uh, took the phone call and 
wouldn't even know what he looks like. Um, and that was pretty much the, the end of our conversation. Um, never once talked to that guy, don't know what he looks like um, and anything that he was given or offering to the athletes or what is talked about in the in the articles and in media. Um, no involvement whatsoever. So, so Matthew, uh, Alberta was charged by USADA with these anti-doping violations in like June 2017. So to be clear, when did you learn that he had been charged by USADA? Uh, never. I mean, I don't know. Yeah, like this week he's saying or did the you article. Learn? Yeah, I mean, I got a call. Like, I got a call from a lawyer about asking about Dr. Brown. Never once knew what the call was about. I mean, obviously, I've heard of the guy, but that was pretty much um, the only time I thought something might have been up, but never once had a conversation with Alberto or hearing from anyone else on the team about this. So. And did the USADA investigation or any of the allegations against Alberto have anything to do with your decision to leave the curve no. for the end of lawsuit? No, no. Um, like I said, um, my decision was personal. I had no idea any of this was going on until this week. So when I left a year ago, obviously I had no idea anything was going on. Um, I said earlier, uh, not here, but like, um, Whatever back at pre when I discussed my uh, reason for leaving was just I felt like I was stagnant with training with Alberto. Um, he wasn't traveling quite as much. His involvement with the group wasn't as much as when I first joined the group in 2012. Um, the guys I joined the group to to train with and you know, had, uh, and race with were either moved up to different distances, left the group, and I felt for me moving forward it was just best to to be happier and uh, you know that's why I left Portland before I even left the group because I was unhappy with who else I wasn't training with anyone I was, I was unhappy with my training environment my training situation um, and I needed something new um, with a big three years coming up which was the start of this year Tokyo and then Eugene um, I felt like I need something fresh something new something to kind of like get me going again and and, uh, and I felt like this after after pretty much how I ran this year um, given where I was months ago I'm extremely happy with my decision and uh, I think I obviously just came to the media but I'm pretty sure me and Jerry's conversation will be one disappointed that a I didn't go with Jared as we spoke before but two just our excitement together about me getting a full year of his type of training under my belt um, although I joined in November I think right after the 5k um, in, in New York City uh, I didn't actually start doing workouts with the group until April um, I was just running, doing runs, or either taking time off for um, two injuries, hamstring and shin. So, like I said, um, I think that's the reason why I was able to last this long in the season. And I was hoping that a lot of guys would be going backwards, but that wasn't the case this year. But um, so, it's not a knock on my performance today, um, but it was just more like what our conversation is going to be moving forward. So I'm, I'm pleased with my decision to, to leave, and um, I've been on the other side of things, you know, like where those guys are right now, like Craig and. Um, the other guys with the Oregon Project um, back in 2015 and it's stressful man especially when um, you know what you're doing um, and that's another thing I was just going to say actually um, you know my conversation uh, with my dad for instance right after this stuff broke and I was like here we go again kind of thing and uh, you know he reminded me he goes look man look son um, I'm telling you right now the godfathers of the sport guys like Gagliano guys that have been in the sport long enough the guys that know my dad that know me that know my family know the way I operate um, I'm a huge, like, it's funny to say this, but I'm a huge fan and statistician of the sport, which most people probably don't even know. Um, I was kicking a soccer ball around up in Georgetown when I was like six, seven, eight years old, watching the Reebok Enclave do workouts. Rich Kanad, John Troutman, um, uh, Steve Holman, uh, when my dad was part-time coaching with Gags. And I've known these guys my whole life. And guys, anyone that knows the sport, anyone that knows my family, um, knows how I compete, knows what we are about, my family. and. After 2015, that's like what, kind of what I took away from it. Just all I care about is that my family, people are close to me, understand how I am. I can't change the minds of anyone out there. They're gonna assume, and, and that's fine. They're, they're gonna assume what they're gonna assume, and I can only do so much on my end by continue to compete clean, train hard, and hope to inspire the people that do believe in me. And um, that's pretty much how I'm gonna leave it off, and, and that's how I'm gonna live my life and how I'm gonna approach the rest of my career. Um, Obviously, it sucks to be in this position when I joined the Oregon Project full time at the end of 2012. Of course, I didn't anticipate any of this. You know, um, I don't think any of those other guys I mentioned anticipated. You know, Dorn Ores, um, Kieran's. Um, I mean, or else we wouldn't have joined it. And uh, but you, I can't knock. I don't think anyone can knock my decision as it was the best training group at the time. There was no accusations. There was nothing that was going on. And 
I would be willing to bet um, almost 10 out of 10 times that anyone in my position coming out of college would have taken the, the position I took uh, with joining the Oregon Project. So. All right. Appreciate the time. All right, thank you, man. Thank you.